Sometimes in wrestling, a gimmick is so great that everyone realizes it right away. Just look at The Undertaker or Kane if you want any evidence of this. Other times, however, what might have been a great character slips between the cracks and ends up going largely forgotten. And while the reasons for this can vary depending on the person, the end result is always the same. Fans miss out on something which could have been special. But what are the biggest examples of underappreciated characters of all time? Well, that's exactly what we're going to be looking at today. So join us as we take a deep dive into Could Have Been Great, Wrestling's Most Underrated Gimmicks. Of course, given how much of wrestling's fan base has already been taken by mixed martial arts in the last couple of decades, it only makes sense that we start out this video with someone who, if capitalized on at the time, might have been huge, and that's Kama, the Supreme Fighting Machine. But why would he have potentially kept MMA fans watching WWF in the mid-90s and beyond? Well, because he was an early example of the company trying to capitalize on the whole phenomenon. Yes, before legit cage fighters such as Ken Shamrock, Brock Lesnar, and Matt Riddle all found their way to the squared circle, the former Papa Shango represented Vince McMahon's first real attempt to create an MMA-themed gimmick. And sure, the difference between Kama and the other names we mentioned is that he never actually spent any time in an octagon. That said, he was known for having some legit shoot fighting skills, skills he would later get to show off in the infamous Brawl for All. Prior to that catastrophe, however, his TV brawling was all an impressive work, and so after returning to WWF in January of 1995, he began the new gimmick by acting as the muscle for Ted DiBiase's Million Dollar Corporation. And this would see him get into a feud with The Undertaker upon stealing the dead man's urn later that year. Unfortunately though, with MMA still being in its infancy, and Vince McMahon not fully being sure how to make a character like this work in a wrestling context, that angle marked the highlight of Kama's run, as by January of 1996, he'd disappear from TV again. Sure, he would return in 1997 still under the Kama name, but at this point, any reference to him being the supreme fighting machine would be quietly swept under the rug, as he instead became Kama Mustafa, the newest member of Farouk's Nation of Domination. And yes, you could argue that this worked out better for him in the long run as over time he morphed into the Godfather, a gimmick so popular it still makes the occasional return to this day. That said, it's not hard to wonder what might have become of Kama had he been given a bigger chance to shine, or even if he'd come a few years later where he could really get to capitalize off the success of UFC. But then maybe he wouldn't have been able to capitalize on this after all, because fast forwarding to the modern day now for a moment, legit shoot fighting skills aren't always a guarantee someone will get over under Vince McMahon's watch, as can be clearly seen in the case of Kushida. In fairness to the boss, though, it wasn't the Tokyo Natives 6-0 MMA record which first got him noticed by the company back in 2019. No, it was his time in New Japan Pro Wrestling where he had a Back to the Future themed gimmick. Yes, apparently being a huge fan of the series, and of Marty McFly in particular, early on in his run, Kushida had taken to coming out to the ring in denim and a red puffy jacket akin to that worn by Michael J. Fox in the trio of films. And while this might have seemed cheesy for some other performers, it worked perfectly here as Kushida's offense was so spectacular and high-flying, it almost defied the laws of time and space at the best of times. So getting hugely over with fans as a result of this then, he'd become a six-time IWGP Junior Heavyweight Champion and a two-time winner of the prestigious Best of the Super Juniors Tournament during his nine years there. Come the turn of the decade, though, he'd begin to feel like he'd done everything he could in Japan, especially as NJPW apparently had little desire to move him up to their heavyweight division. And that was what ultimately led him to sign on the dotted line with WWE in April of 2019 then, as from there, he reported to NXT, where he'd work directly under Triple H. So presumably, his eye-catching in-ring style and his western-friendly gimmick saw him become a big star in WWE following this? Well, no, as it happened, because even with the game having a better track record at booking talent, he still managed to botch Kushida spectacularly. How did he do this? Well, by not really doing much with his newest signing at all. Yes, after having some early encounters against the likes of Cassius Ono and Tony Nese, the Japanese star just sort of fell into the background. And when a bone eventually was thrown his way in April of 2020 in the form of the NXT Cruiserweight title, then most people had really stopped caring. So perhaps it's no surprise that once his contract expired in April of 2022, Kushida decided to cut bait and return back to his homeland again, where he now serves as part of the New Japan roster once more.
And he's not the only person who'd leave WWE in order to get better recognized, because years prior to this in 1995, Jean-Pierre Lafitte was going through a similar situation when he had to reckon with the fact that Vince McMahon just didn't know what to do with his gimmick. But what was this gimmick? Well, it was basically an eye patch wearing pirate, and sure, it's a little cheesy, but by mid-90s WWF standards, this was positively gritty and realistic. Hell, there was even a shoot element to the whole thing, as in reality, Lafitte had lost sight in one eye some time prior to this. That's right, after serving a spell with Jacques Rougeau as one half of the Quebecers in 1993 and 1994, he'd gone partially blind, with this probably explaining how the boss came up with the eye patch wearing gimmick in the first place. Still, despite the whole thing having the potential to be a disaster, the French-Canadian star made it work for him through sheer tyranny of will, as not long after re-debuting under this new moniker, he'd enter into a feud with Bret Hart. Yes, like any good pirate, Lafitte was prone to bouts of theft, and so seeing a perfect opportunity on an early episode of Raw then, he'd steal the hitman's jacket. And that soon led to a series of bouts between the two which were surprisingly good. So good, in fact, that the notoriously grumpy Hart actually went out of his way to praise his opponent and put him over as someone with a lot of potential as a single star. Sadly, though, a group of people who didn't share the hitman's opinion were the Click, as after apparently getting into a backstage conflict with Lafitte, they pretty much got him blacklisted from the company in the eyes of Vince McMahon. That said, it wasn't like he would never find success again because, years later, he'd be reborn on the indie circuit as PCO, the self-proclaimed French Frankenstein who, despite being in his 50s at this point, was able to put out some of the best work of his career. But what of his one-time tag team partner Jacques Rougeau? After all, by the time the Quebecers had formed in 1993, he was already in the midst of a hugely underrated gimmick of his own. Yes, when you think of early 90s heels, it's hard not to think back on the largely missed opportunity, which was the Mountie. Of course, part of the reason this one was such a missed opportunity was because Rougeau bought into the gimmick so deeply. In fact, every time he came out to the ring from 1991 onwards so as to deliver a beatdown to an opponent, he had such a look of glee on his face, it was hard to believe he wasn't enjoying it. And maybe that's because this marked his first chance to shine on a solo stage in New York, as in years prior, he'd been mostly known as one half of the fabulous Rougeau brothers. With Vince McMahon realizing there was more potential to be milked out of him, however, he was quick to offer Jacques the role of a lifetime when, at the turn of the decade, he came up with the character of the Mountie. Who was the Mountie? Well, he was a Mountie, a member of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police to be exact and this meant he'd be portrayed as the foreign heel when he got into early feuds with the likes of Tito Santana and the Big Boss Man. Except for when they ventured up to the Great White North, that was, because, due to the company not wanting to offend the local police force in Canada, the Mountie portrayed himself in a far more babyface manner there, with him actually going by his real name of Jacques Rougeau instead. Back in the States, however, his heelish tendencies could not be stopped, and that was enough for him to even get a brief run with the Intercontinental title in 1992. That said, this would also mark the highlight of his run, as despite there being a lot of potential in having him move up the card even further, WWF instead decided to shift Rougeau back into a tag team role when they had him pair up with Pierre Carl Ouellette to form the Quebecers. And they're not the only performers who were around at this time that never got the chance to reach their full potential either, because between 1991 and 1993, the saga of Skinner proved that sometimes the timing just isn't right. Yes, back in the early 90s, Vince McMahon had hoped to make Steve Kern one of his promotion's next top gimmicks, but who was Steve Kern? Well, he was a popular figure on the territory circuit during the 70s and 80s, with most of his success coming during his time spent at Championship Wrestling from Florida. By 1991, however, with the territories being dead and WWF being one of only two real options left in North America, Kern decided to sign up with Vince McMahon's promotion when he was pitched on the idea of a new character. And part of the reason for his acceptance of this was that the character he was being asked to play, an alligator hunter, wasn't a million miles away from his real-life personality. Sure, he may not have hunted gators before himself, but growing up in Tampa, he'd seen his fair share of them. So using this then, he'd come out to the ring carrying a claw from one of his trophies, with the hopes being that this would be enough to psych out his opponent for the night. Sadly though, while this method did work on a few lower card acts, whenever Skinner was expected to go up against a bigger name like Bret Hart, things didn't go so well for him. 
and we know this because, in what was probably the highlight of his entire run at this point, he'd failed to defeat the Hitman when the two went at it over the Intercontinental title at December 3rd, 1991's This Tuesday in Texas. After that, a single attempt to win the WWF title from Macho Man Randy Savage aside, Skinner's fall down the card would be as quick as it was dramatic. And that was why, by the time 1993 came around, he'd have dropped the gimmick altogether, with him instead being relegated to making a cameo appearance at WrestleMania 9 as the doppelganger Doink during the Evil Clowns match against Crush. Could more have been made of the heel alligator hunter? Sure. But we'll never get to find out how far he could have gone now. And we'll also never get to see how far another popular performer could have gone a couple of years later, as in 1995, Dean Douglas became yet another victim of the click. Of course, his popularity prior to that had largely come about as a result of his run in Paul Heyman's Extreme Championship Wrestling. But with there not being a lot of money to be made in Philly, even for a franchise player like him, Shane Douglas, as he was known at the time, instead made the jump to New York in the middle of the decade so as to seek greater fortune and fame. At this point though, given we were in the period of wrestlers with jobs, a new gimmick would have to be created for him, as the hardcore fighter just wasn't going to fly in new generation era WWF. So after asking the ECW alumni about his past and discovering that he was once a high school teacher, Vince McMahon decided to rebrand him as Dean Douglas, a heel wrestling teacher who often graded other performances poorly and used the subsequent F grades he gave them to get in their heads. One group who were not willing to let Douglas psych them out, however, was The Click, because after he was booked to win the Intercontinental title following Shawn Michaels' decision to vacate it later that year, the group got together with Vince McMahon backstage and used their influence to have any lengthy run with the belt squashed. And that was how, as soon as he was awarded it, the franchise was forced to defend it against Razor Ramon, with him losing this match in short order and being sent packing back down the card after the fact. Of course, as fans would later find out once he returned to ECW, Douglas still had it in him to be a star. So it's just a shame that his mid-90s WWF gimmick never got a chance to go any further because if it had, he might have been able to turn it into something special. But then it's not as if he were the only one on the roster at the time who wasn't being used to his full potential because after forming that year and quickly feeling like they would be a slam dunk hit for the tag team division, the Body Donnas never really went anywhere of note. Not that no member of the trio ever found greater success though, because over the next few years, the team's valet Sonny became a big hit with fans as a backstage personality, manager, and occasional commentator. As for Skip and Zip though, their time with the company wouldn't be as successful. No, despite the gimmick of two fitness experts seemingly being right up Vince McMahon's alley, they never became the superstars they could have. Sure, they would get a couple of noteworthy moments, such as when they briefly won the tag team titles in early 1996, but once they lost those belts to the Godwins, Sunny also decided to drop them, as she felt she could make more money with a better set of clients at this point. And that was the beginning of the end for the Body Donnas as it turned out, because after a feud with Tammy Sitch's new team, the Smoking Guns saw the fitness enthusiasts come out on the losing end, Skip would fall to injury, and Zip would from there be reduced to the role of lower card jobber in the singles division. Then when Skip returned from his injury, his remaining time on the roster was filled with backstage peril as he was forced to deal with the fact that Sonny, his real life girlfriend, was engaging in a not so quiet affair with Shawn Michaels. Yes, yet another victim of the click, Chris Candido was effectively done at this point, and that meant any potential the Body Donnas had as a duo would never come to fruition, and fans would always be left to wonder what could have been. But then tag team wrestlers have always had a bit of a ceiling under Vince McMahon anyways, so maybe things were never going to get to a main event level even if they had stuck around. And it's this very attitude towards the division which has seen the boss sleep on a number of potential star gimmicks over the years, one of the most notable of which was Deuce and Domino in 2007 and 2008. Yes, while down in Ohio Valley Wrestling, WWE's developmental brand at the time, in 2006, the pair's 50s greaser-inspired gimmick had seen them become such a hit with fans they'd win the OVW Southern Tag Team titles. Of course, it also helped that they had a petticoat-wearing valet named Cherry by their side to help them out here too. And with her there and gold around their waists then, it wasn't long before they were feuding with the likes of The Miz and CM Punk. Once they'd reached the main roster the following year, however, things wouldn't be as successful because with Vince McMahon seeing a very clear shelf life on the gimmick, he'd be hesitant to push the duo too hard. Sure, he did give them a run with the WWE Tag Team titles after they beat Paul London and Brian Kendrick for the honor, 
Unfortunately though, getting a tag title reign at this point in time meant less than it did during the days of the Hardys, the Dudleys, and Edge and Christian, as the perception of the belts had lowered by then. Instead then, the real measure of success for a WWE tag team in 2007 was how seriously they were being treated. And in the case of Deuce and Domino, the answer to this was not very serious at all, because after losing their gold to the makeshift pairing of Matt Hardy and MVP early the following year, they'd pretty quickly be phased down the card, with this all leading up to them unceremoniously splitting on the May 23rd episode of SmackDown. Could more have been done with their throwback gimmick? Of course, but by now, we were getting into the era of the boss's increasingly erratic booking and someone else who felt the brunt of this booking came along at this same point too as it happened because in 2006, Vince McMahon quickly realized he had no idea what to do with Jimmy Wang Yang. Who was Jimmy Wang Yang? Well, he was James Yoon, a seasoned indie performer. And growing up in Austell, Georgia, he'd identify with his southern roots, something he'd use as part of his gimmick upon joining the WWE. That's right, Wang would portray himself as a rootin' tootin' cowboy geared up in leather chaps and a Stetson hat. Yes, it was all redneck all the time for Jimmy as he'd start rising up the ranks by getting into programs with the likes of Chavo Guerrero Jr. Then, once he was firmly established, he'd even pick up a number of managers in the form of Amy Zidian and later on Tori Wilson. Unfortunately though, he wouldn't rise much higher than this because with the boss just not seeing the potential he had for someone who could shift between comedy wrestler and serious high flying threat so easily, Wang Yang would soon be relegated to lower card purgatory. Still, being in the lower card isn't always a bad thing because sometimes it can give a performer a unique opportunity to get a less traditional gimmick over. And when it comes to people who made the best of the hand they were dealt, few have been more successful than Kurt Hawkins during the period he had his famous losing streak. Yes, for most performers, being seen as an eternal loser would be the kiss of death for their career. But when Hawkins was informed in late 2017 that he was going over on Heath Slater as he hasn't won a match in some time, he fought back against this, realizing that if he won, there would be nowhere else for him to go other than Jobberdom. If he lost, however, he could keep continuing on with the gimmick and turn himself into the bizarro version of Goldberg. So after convincing his bosses this was the best idea, that's exactly what he'd do, racking up 269 straight losses by the time WrestleMania 35 came around in April of 2019. And while there are those who argued that it was the perfect end to this story to have him and his real-life best friend Zack Ryder beat the Revival for the Raw Tag Team titles here, there's also the argument that even much more could have been done with the character had it been allowed to go on a little longer. After all, pretty much the entirety of it had happened in lower card matches on B-shows, so few even got to see the majority of the angle play itself out. And sure, well, that was part of the whole gimmick of Hawkins being the ultimate jobber. A lot more drama could have been made of the whole thing had he been placed in high-profile matches, allowing fans to believe that maybe, just maybe, he'd squeak out a win over a bigger star in a moment of sheer luck. In the end, though, the company made their decision and went with it. And it turned out great for Hawkins as he finally got his big WrestleMania moment out of it. So maybe it just goes to show that sometimes, even if a gimmick is underrated and never reaches the fullest of its potential, there can still be enough good which comes from it that a select group of people will always remember it as being a quiet favorite for them personally.